Uh, my name is Jake Cantor. I'm the executive editor of Business Insider in the UK. Uh, I'm also chair of the Broadcasting Press Guild over here. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined uh, for this Game Changer session by Nancy Daniels, uh, the Chief Brand Officer, Discovery and Factual. What does that mean? Well, she oversees the brand strategy, development, production, marketing and day-to-day -day operations of the Discovery Channel and Science Channel. No small job. <laughs> uh, Nancy is pretty fresh to the role, uh, having had her feet under the desk for just four to five months. Uh, previously, she was the president and general manager of TLC. Uh, we'll be talking today about her career, her vision for discovery, uh, where the UK fits into her plans, and uh, much more besides. Before we get going, um, I just want to mention that the app is working again and you can submit your questions anonymous, anonymously uh, if you want to ask uh, Nancy anything at the end. We'll have about 10 minutes uh, for some questions. So welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, so reasonably new to the role. How, yes. how are you settling in? Uh, finally feeling like I'm settling in. Um, the first couple of months were absolutely getting up to speed. I have the the benefit of working at Discovery as a whole as a corporate entity for a long time, but also prior to being the president and general manager of TLC, I headed up production and development on Discovery. So I had uh, some familiarity with the brand, with the show, some of the shows, with some of the talent, um, and then certainly a lot of the people who work on the network. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness for that, because starting cold would have been, I, I think my head would still be spinning. Um, but it's been exciting to kind of uh, to kind of take on the mantle of a brand that is so big and meaningful, um, and certainly is the flagship of this this big corporate entity. So take us back to the start of your career. At what point did you decide that uh, TV was for you? Ah, um, I l always love TV. I mean, I'm one of those kids probably like a lot of us in this room that grew up spending way too many hours watching TV every single day. And um, you know, everybody tells you it's bad for you, but clearly it worked out. And uh, I, I wanted to work in the business. When I was, I, I grew up in, um, in New England. Um, and when I was about 15, I had the opportunity to go to LA. I, have, um, I had an uncle who actually was in the business and cousins who were in the business. My uncle was one of, uh, one of the original game show guys and producers and one of the shows he helped create was The People's Court. Um, and so there was a little bit of, of pedigree there that I could tap into. So I got to look to go behind the scenes and see how it was all put together and you know, I, was, I was done for. Until then I couldn't get to LA fast enough. So that was, uh, that was the moment where you thought, <laughs> Well, I thought this, this looks like this way more fun. My, my father is a very smart man, electrical engineer, worked in the defense industry building nuclear submarines. I knew that wasn't for me. Um, and uh, my mother is a musician, and I'm, I'm not a terribly talented musician. So uh, to find something that looked like really fun and, um, and, and connected with something I loved, and that you could actually have a job doing what you loved and what was your passion was, was kind of the coolest thing to me. So you started as a, a freelancer, is that right? Yes. And how has that helped shape the way you approach your role now as a, as a commissioner? I think it was the biggest gift um, to work in production. Uh, I started as a PA. I worked my way up um, through doing you know, field producing, story producing, uh, show running, cable shows, like in the very early days of cable when there was like $5 to, <laughs> to a budget. And uh, it was just really invaluable. Also, the fact that your job always had an end date. So you'd go work on a show, you knew it would be on for eight weeks, your job would be eight weeks, or it could be eight months, you, you know, whatever it was, you knew it had an end date, which in some ways was very scary. Like, what am I gonna do next? Where am I gonna get my next job? How am I gonna pay my rent? But in other ways, it, it actually accelerates your career because every time you move on, you learn something new, you maybe get another shot, you might get another chance to, to bump up your title um, and just meet more people. And then when I did transition to the network side of things, uh, I think it was really helpful for me in decision making and not being afraid of 
losing my job, frankly, that there always is another job and you have to do what's right and what you think is right for the job and, and make decisions based on that rather than worrying about the, the future so much because it was always there for me. So, I mean, producers value deci decisiveness, don't they? I mean, have you, has that helped, you know, having that experience on the production side, has that helped make you more decisive? I think for me, it's helped probably mostly looking at shows and being in edit bays and understanding how that works, how, how the sausage gets made, so to speak, and being able to, to, to give thoughtfulness, but also understand the creativity and, um, and respect the work that's going on on the other side. I mean, I have a deep respect for producers in the production community from being on that side of it. Um, coming to the other side of it, and going behind the curtain a little bit was also shocking in its own, <laughs> in its own way uh, to understand how the sausage gets made on, on that side of things. Uh, but it, it's made me try to, try to kind of translate that in a better way out of a situation that can sometimes be very tenuous between the, the networks and the producers. So Discovery CEO David Zaslav described you as a winner. <laughs> what does he mean by that? <laughs> Um, that's a huge compliment. <laughs> um, I work really well with, with David, and uh, David likes results. And what kind of results? Ratings. Ratings. Is that first and foremost? Yeah, definitely. And um, you know, we worked really, we worked through some really um, dark days when I was uh, president and GM of TLC, and we were able to turn it around and just never gave up. And, um, and he, I think he appreciated that, obviously, because here I am. Um, he, he turned over the, the flagship network to me. But, um, Is that a turnaround job? In some respects, I think there's, there's been a downward trajectory on ratings that you can't deny when you look at it. Um, the brand is still there and is very strong. A big focus of ours is definitely getting some new series up and running. We haven't really had a new breakout hit in a few years, it's a huge priority. And it's not for lack of trying, by the way. Um, it's very difficult to break through, as probably everybody in this room knows. It's very hard to find something that breaks through. So um, that's, that's where we see, I see opportunity. Okay, so what did you learn in the thick of some of those, those dark moments at TLC uh, and turning that channel around and how are you going to apply that to discovery? A few things. Number one is know your audience and love them and respect them. And don't try to turn them into something they're not. So, for example, on TLC, we, made a, we took a few shots at trying to go younger. And um, not only did we not really get the younger viewers there, we kind of lost some of our core viewers who were coming. So, know the audience you have and over deliver to them and then you can keep adding on to that that was a huge one for me another one was if if something's if something the thing that sounds so simple uh, if something's working do more of that you know just <laughs> do more of it so as an example on tlc we had a breakout hit called 90 day fiance i think here it's called 90 days to wed and uh we just, we, we built it so it was strong. We didn't spin it off too early, but then we started spinning it off or doing two hour episodes if the, if the content could deliver for across two hours. And instead of having one hour of a monster rating, now you have two or maybe even three on one night. I mean, that, that is a game changer. And that could change the whole outlook of your network and turn any, you know, any red to green when you're looking at year on year growth. So, it was just do more of, of what's working. Think about another, another strategy we did at TLC, and I was worried about it, was um, we, we called it Netflixing the schedule, where we would do two hours or three original hours of something all in a row, where you know, it, it, traditionally that would be, well, we shouldn't do that. You know, that's too much for the audience. They don't want to stay for it. But the fact is, everybody's binging all the time now. So why not just give it to them all while they're there and they're ready? If they love it enough, they will sit and enjoy your content. So 
you can't overdo it. The content has to deliver. You can't just take something that's an hour and stretch it out. But if you can produce more of it and make stronger hours, it's okay to have multiple hours per night. So you're effectively encouraging binge viewing. Yes. But in a slightly different way on yeah. schedule. Yeah, and it worked. TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, can you see yourself doing similar things at, at Discovery and Science? Absolutely. I think. Ha, is there anything so we, practically happening at the moment? That you um, we've looked at, you know, we're looking at some of our core shows. Gold Rush, for example, a huge hit for us um, from a UK production company. And we look at the season coming up and say, as they're filming, because what's really happening is really happening, but are there moments, are there episodes that are going to be worthy of a two hour? Like, let's do that. And, and getting in on it early and trying to expand that out. But doing it with hit franchises, I don't think I would want to come out of the gate with a brand new show with a two hour episode. I think that's a lot to ask of a new viewer. But with some, with, when you have super fans, you want to continue to nourish them with more of what they love and they'll come for it. So one of your brands that's in pretty rude health is uh, Shark Week. And um, we've got a clip and we'll, we'll talk a bit about why that's working for you guys. So, so 30 years of, yeah. of Shark, Shark Week, mm -hmm. and this year you had quite a lot of bite, didn't it? <laughs> you excuse the pun. It's a monster hit, excuse the pun. But um, <laughs> yeah, 30 years of, of Shark Week, it, uh, it really is huge. And um, in the US, it is a huge pop culture phenomenon. Everybody loves Shark Week. Uh, we see it over and over again. But what I love about this and what I wanted, wh why I think this, this clip, why I wanted to show it and why I think it's successful is because it's everything that discovery can be. So there's a, a certain level of, of entertainment value there. We did a show with, with you could see it with Shaquille O'Neal. Um, we, uh, we did a crossover with Shark Tank, which is uh, you know Dragon's Den in the, in the US, it's called Shark Tank, and it was Shark Tank meets Shark Week. So we really kind of got entertaining and made sure there was a certain level of, of um, pure entertainment across the week. But at the same time, there was a lot of science and traditional documentaries and discoveries, um, messages of shark conservation, things that you can learn about sharks coming out of it. And at the end of the day, you come out of the, out of the week feeling a little bit smarter about sharks. And when I think about Discovery as a brand, that's what we should do at our best. We should, be, we should entertain and inform, um, and both are really important. And you know, just because something's really, really smart, if, if nobody's coming to it to watch it because it's not entertaining, we're not doing our job. And that's a huge challenge. So it was uh, your fourth best ratings, isn't it, over the yeah, 30 years? Yeah, so, so over 30 year history of Shark Week, this was the fourth best um, in, in the 30 years, which is pretty amazing. The, the Shaq special we did, um, it was a bit of a risk for us. It was a, frankly, it was a buddy comedy. And we weren't sure how our audience would receive that, and they loved it. And even the audience feedback we got was almost completely positive, and that was our fourth highest rated shark special of all time. So what lessons can you take from Shark Week this year and, and apply them? Well, I'll tell general? you one, which is we, we filmed the shark, uh, the shack one two weeks before air. I, that's a lesson I don't ever want to do again. <laughs> pretty quick turnaround. <laughs> it was a very quick turnaround. It was a bit of a nail biter. Um, thank goodness it turned out okay. But uh, I, my big lessons, a couple of them, come out of the gate big, like we have to outdo ourselves for next year. The highest rated Shark Week special we've ever done is Phelps, Michael Phelps versus Shark, where they, um, where they swam to see who, who was fastest. It's the shark, um, <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. And uh, that's the highest rated one we've ever done. That was last year. And we have to constantly keep thinking of how are we going to outdo ourselves? What are we going to do that's new and different? Can you imagine 30 years of Shark Week specials? This year we did 22 original hours around sharks. We have to keep finding new and, and, and exciting and innovative ways. I was going to say, how much ways. is there to say about sharks? Apparently there's a lot. And uh, there's a lot of research that we're, we're, we take part in. There's always new shark behavior they're discovering. Um, and there's a lot more to be done there. Another, another lesson I learned is um, 
great whites. Great whites are like the kings of Shark Week, and any show that has great whites in it uh, just does better. People are just in awe of those creatures, so we just have to keep telling them more and more about them. What did you make of Nat Geo doing a bit more Shark Week? <laughs> What, what is it they say? It's uh, the sincerest form of flattery is when somebody um, imitates Imitation, you. Imitation, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess part of what you're talking about with Shark Week and some of its success is, you know, is building event television, I guess, to a, to a certain extent, making, making an appointment to view for your, your audience. Mm -hmm. uh, are you... Um, are you thinking about that with other with other shows of, of building sort of bigger brands around other 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 programs? What do you mean, like like stunting, like Shark Week, or just I, I guess making more of an event out of a show? I mean, I, I know you've got perhaps we could talk a bit about oh. uh, above and beyond. So, well, I mean, that's yeah. a little bit of our kind of big documentary strategy, and. There's, there, on, on Discovery, there are long-running series, which we love and are the bread and butter of what we do, but we also need to do big, heavy-hitting documentaries with some of the world's best filmmakers um, tackling stories that they are passionate about. And that's what, what this one is um, that you're teeing up, which is um, we teamed up with Rory Kennedy, who is the niece of JFK, the daughter of Bobby Kennedy, and she is an um, Emmy Award-winning, Oscar-nominated documentarian, um, and she wanted to do a whole exploration of the birth of NASA, which of course is core to JFK's mission when he was president, getting a man on the moon. So we, we did a, um, a documentary with her, Above and Beyond, but it's also going to be a global play. We're rolling it out globally. We think it's a global story. And uh, Rory is going to be coming over here to the UK to be um, talking up the film. And yes, trying to make it um, as big as, of an event as we can as we approach the 60th anniversary of NASA. Should we take a look at Above and Beyond? TV loves an anniversary, and obviously NASA, uh, the 60th anniversary here, which is a uh, as a, an obvious one. It, when you're thinking about shows that you're going to go big on, I guess, and place big bets on, mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you weigh up? If we think about our audience, what are they interested in? Are we gonna, are, are we gonna capture the zeitgeist of a moment um, and be able to deliver something original and exciting that people are gonna want to engage with Discovery on? I think that's a big part of it. Um, and yeah, timing's a, it's, it's a, it's, we're always looking at what's coming up. I mean, we're coming up on the anniversary of the moon landing next summer, and we're looking at multiple different projects where we can address that. What's going to be the right one? What's going to be the right way? Uh, we're still figuring out, but we think there's huge opportunity there. I think everybody will be thinking about it and talking about it with such a moment. Um, so constantly looking at that, and then it is about timing and, um, and, and our, when are we gonna, when are we gonna market it? How are we gonna market it? How are we gonna even tell people it's there? And during that process, how much are you thinking about your US audience and how much are you thinking about your international audience? Well, we, I mean, I, I am in charge of the US channel. So um, I am looking at the US audience and certainly that's, um, that's, that's where it begins, but we are, constantly engaging with um, all of the people in Discovery Networks International. They're in our green light meetings, they're involved in our development pipeline, so they understand what we're doing, and when we find the right thing that feels like a global story, we can roll it out all together at the same time, and that's exciting as well, when we can do that. That shows the power of Discovery around the world. And we were talking uh, just before we came on stage about uh, Blue Planet 2 and how yeah. that really captured a moment and um, uh, resonated far beyond uh, just a TV program. Um, you obviously had a big natural history deal with the BBC which ended in 2013. Do you, do you have any second, second thoughts about that? Do you, do you regret that, that decision to, to part ways with the BBC? I think we miss natural history 
and we are absolutely engaging and looking at ways to bring it back in a big way on discovery. And uh, you know, we've commissioned, outright commissioned with the BBC Natural History Unit, I think they're here in the room, hello. Um, uh, you know, uh, shows that we will be able to exploit globally on, on all of our channels and that's definitely a huge priority for us. Uh, we, we, we do miss the, 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 the most recent I can think of, of a Blue Planet 2 moment here, and it was long before I worked at Discovery, but was Planet Earth when that was on Discovery, and it, I know it was big here too, but that was such a moment in the US when everybody was talking about it. And we definitely need to get back to some of those moments at Discovery. What, in terms of your natural history thinking, what, what stands out to you at the moment? Are there any themes that you're uh, looking to explore specifically? You know, we've, uh, and I'm talking very broadly here, but you know, one of the things we found from our audience um, exp exploration, I'm talking more big, big docs as well, but there are kind of two areas that our audience feels like haven't been fully explored, space and the oceans. And those feel like the final frontiers in a way. So we're definitely looking at um, from a natural history perspective, oceans and what are the stories there? Where can you explore and what are we going to find? And uh, just, I guess, part of that, I mean, Rich Ross, your predecessor, I don't think, as far as I'm aware, he wasn't massively keen on live events, but you have ordered a number in your previous roles. <laughs> um, is that something you'd, you'd bring to the mix? Yeah, I'm excited to do live events. I don't know what they are yet. <laughs> give me, give me a beat. But yeah, and we're we're constantly talking about it. In fact, um, looking at Shark Week, looking at specials, looking at documentaries. Uh, I just hired back Howard Swartz, um, who had been on Discovery prior. He was one of the people who oversaw a lot of our live events. Um, he's been over here for the last couple of years working at Arrow. Um, sell, on the selling side, and now I'm bringing back to Discovery to really um, oversee Shark Week, for sure, but also to um, help oversee our specials and live events. And that's exciting to me. And what about just sort of generally, tonally, at Discovery at the moment? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to inject a bit of optimism into people's front rooms? Yes. I think we all need a little bit of optimism right now. And um, certainly, in the U.S., then it, it's the news is is pretty dark. Um, it's very it's a very divisive time, and anywhere you go, you can find a lot of things to worry about. And it it doesn't even matter if it's the news. It could be um, your Facebook feed. Um, it could be your Twitter feed. There's just a lot of 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 scary darkness out there. And when I think about discovery at its best. Uh, it should be a respite from that, and it should give you a sense of awe and wonder about the globe and the world and make you want to see more and excited to learn more and maybe feel a little bit smarter from watching it. And that, when we're doing it at, at its best, that's what we'll be delivering on. And be a bit of a respite. There's a lot of bad news out there. Let's, let's just take a breather. <laughs> You said all of that without mentioning the Trump, the Trump word. <laughs> um, you're probably not going to get into politics. I, I, I understand that. But has that, has that mission ever been more pronounced? I mean, is it, is it more important now, does it feel like, than, than it has done in, in recent history? Absolutely. I think we, see, we do see a certain amount of um, um, responsibility to... Uh, showing, showing the awe and wonder of the globe and making sure people realize how big this world is and how amazing it is. And the underlying message of all of that is that we need to protect it. Okay. Uh, we've talked a bit about what you are doing. Um, something you're doing less of or, or, or none at all, it seems, mm -hmm. going forward is, is scripted. Uh, could you explain the thinking behind that? Definitely. At the time, um, we did a couple of big scripted projects I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of networks and broadcasters and commissioners were getting into scripted. There seemed to be a lot of opportunity there. And um, even some of our you know, nonfiction brethren were doing the same thing. And it felt like something we should be doing. I think the team is very proud of what we did for the scripted projects we did. 
But at the end of the day, there's a lot of scripted projects out there. I mean, think about your own cue on your TV at home and all the things you want to watch or need to watch or heard are amazing. It's really even harder to break through there. So we took a moment to take a breath and think, okay, let's do what we're really good at and what we're known for, which is you know, nonfiction documentary storytelling. Why did it not cut through for you in quite the same way as it has on that geo or history in the US? Maybe timing, but I also would, I would also maybe argue that point a little bit. Because <laughs> um, I, I don't, I, I, certainly Harlena Davidson's was, w did very well for the network. But it, it's, it's a different part of the brain that we're not used to using. It was a different expertise. I think that's definitely what, what Rich brought to the table. And, um, and it, it was a lot to get a, a network up and running around that and do the business of running Discovery. Mm. And um, something that has become a, a kind of major theme here in the UK particularly is uh, in recent years is, is kind of rebooting old formats. Mm. Um, and you, you did um, Trading Spaces, you bought that back mm -hmm. at TLC, didn't mm -hmm. you? Is that something you would look to, to do at Discovery? Dust off some old brands and... and uh, yeah, we've even, I mean, we've, we've done it to a certain extent with uh, American Shopper, uh, bringing that back and seeing success around it. And um, definitely, we, believe me, like we've combed through everything and the history of the network and what had really connected in a big way um, and what is ready for a reboot. So there's a few things we have in talks which are too early to talk about, but it's, it's definitely something we're looking at. And it was, it was a huge success on, on TLC to bring back Trading Spaces. It was, it was so fun and the right thing to do. And that, that show was so clear because it was such a monster brand defining hit for TLC. Uh, it's been a little bit harder to just pinpoint exactly what that is on Discovery. What, what kind of ingredients do you look for? At, at the, something that at the moment it was a big hit was such a, a, a pop culture phenomenon that if you bring it up to people, they'll tell you stories about watching it. Or when we, when we greenlit Trading Spaces, I can't even believe the amount of people who came out of the woodwork to me to tell me either they, how they'd watch that show and it made them like figure out how to paint in their own house or how they had actually driven for hours to go to some mall appearance of Ty Pennington or whatever it may be. It was such a, it w there were such super fans of that show who were hungry for it to come back. And that is something we look for. Yeah, the hunger from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and you've obviously got, I mean, you mentioned Gold Rush already, these, these kind of big evergreen formats. Can you, you know, do they have a lot of life left in them? Is, uh, you know, can you iterate on what you already have? I believe there's a lot of life left in them, but we can't ever, you know, sit back and rest either. We have to constantly be iterating, be figuring out what is the audience tiring of, what, why do they keep coming back every year? Again, giving them more of what they want and making sure we're tapping into that. But Deadliest Catch, I think, is going on season 14. That's amazing. Uh, whoever thought that a show would last that long? And it's still, so I, you know, I was on Discovery for a while, I went to TLC, came back to Discovery. I hadn't watched Deadliest Catch in a few years. I put in the first episode of the new season, and I was like, dang, the show is still so good. It really delivers every time. And the, you know, kudos to the producers who do that, because they do such a good job. And that's what we constantly have to be doing with, with these shows, is making sure that when you do watch them, you just get that same feeling every time. It's not easy. Not easy. Mm -mm. Is that one of the toughest jobs in TV, is keeping established brands healthy? Yes. Yes. And it, it Do commissioners get enough credit for doing that? You know, I mean, I think it's, it's a joint effort with the producers, you know, it's not, it's everybody has to be all in on it and it, it can't be one person over the other and um, you, everybody has to be on board with it. And I guess at the other end of the scale, you've got, you've got the big long running brands and um, you know, during the preparation for today, 
your team used a, a word which I really liked and I haven't heard before, was instrumentary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, we just did one. Um, do do I, we explain what it is? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's really a quick turn documentary. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's if something is popping in the news that we think is a relevant story to our audience, can we do something quickly but with enough time to give enough of a, of a discovery POV on it uh, and, and put it on the air. So we did something with ITN, I think Ian's somewhere in here, um, hello, and uh, we did a, a show about the Thai cave rescue of... Um, Extraordinary story. It was a crazy story. And it was a discovery story. It was um, exploration, it was survival, it was engineering, it was heroic, um, it was life and death stakes, and thank God it was a happy ending. And we actually commissioned that before we knew what the ending was gonna be. And we're so glad to see how it all played out. And by the time we got it on air, it was just a few days after the, the final um, boy and coach had been taken out. So it, it, was, um, it, worked, it, it worked well for us in the US, but it worked even better for us around the globe. Because I think it was such a global story too. Yeah. And we'll, we'll keep looking for those kinds of things and you don't know when those are gonna come, obviously. They're usually news related. And we haven't done a lot of them in the last few years. So I think we have to kind of, we kind of have to get used to doing some of that stuff. So we're gonna see a bit more opportunistic. Commission. Yeah, I would, I would like to. I mean, I would like, it, it'll keep watching and see as things are popping up what we end up doing. I guess, I mean, you're dictated by the news cycle to a certain extent. Totally. Um, but are there, I mean, are there obvious topics? Are there obvious disasters or um, uh, events, natural events or scientific events that... that you, know, you know, we've you talked know a lot about the volcanoes, um, especially what's been going on in Hawaii. Like, is that the right thing to do? Um, it hasn't... It's still going, you know? So it hasn't felt like there's the right moment to do it. But we're constantly looking. And it is like those themes I just talked about. You know, survival, exploration, you know, human... Um, you know, like rising to the occasion, overcoming adversity on a, on a gut human level is something that it all came together with that story. I guess that kind of leads us quite neatly into to Cajun, Cajun Navy. Yes. Do you want to just explain what that is a little bit and, yeah. uh, and tee up the clip perhaps? So, so one of the things when I came back to Discovery and when we were looking at our documentaries and what we want to be doing and, and kind of that level of optimism and reaching the audience we had, we looked at what are some of the, the stories that even the people that, the, the guys that are watching Deadliest Catch and Gold Rush, that really is reflective of their world. And um, the story of the Cajun Navy came up. And if, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's the group of um, men and women in the South who came together around Hurricane Katrina to rescue their friends and neighbors when um, the you know the, the public authorities weren't even just weren't even able to get there so they got themselves together created their own sort of Cajun Navy and would go around rescuing people and they've become much more organized and are ready to jump in if something happens so last year during Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma which were huge I mean Harvey was so devastating in Houston and there were these stories on the news of you would just see a line of, of trucks, like pickup trucks, coming in on the highway, all pulling their boats, their little boats, all just going, going in to go and help people. And we're actually doing this with Lightbox Entertainment, uh, which is an, you know, an Oscar-winning Simon Chin and his brother Jonathan Chin, um, UK company, doing a decidedly US story, and we're really excited about it. So here's a little clip. When we're talking about online and the, and the digital world, obviously there's increasing competition from the likes of Amazon and, and Netflix. But how much does that preoccupy your, your thinking? How much do you worry about the, you know, the demand for talent and, uh, and access to great stories? So all of, all of the streaming services, they're absolutely another competitor for us. 
and we feel like we, we have an incredible platform for, for creatives and producers and production companies to come to to highlight their shows and their programs. And that's not always the case on all these streaming services. I think um, a lot of people I know have done a lot of producing and programming and, and put it out there and, it, and it's hard to find. And it can disappear unless it's something that they pick to market, which is, you know, with all of the content out there, it's few and far between to actually get, get chosen for the marketing. I feel like we, in success on Discovery, you know, a, a project can have, year, look at 14 seasons of Deadliest Catch, you know? There's just huge opportunity with Discovery. So as far as getting talent, yeah, it's another competitor. And it's something we look at, but I'll be honest with you, there hasn't been a lot of cases where I feel like we've lost out. So you've never, there's never been an idea which has come across your desk, but then ended up on Netflix, for example, and you thought, damn. <laughs> Not yet. I'm sure it will happen, but um, not yet. No. And do you, I mean, is the competition tougher than ever? Or well, I think it's previous a, experience? I, I think it's a really great time to be a producer. <laughs> I mean, a content creator. Because there's so many opportunities out there. Uh, so for us, it's making sure we're getting the stories we want. We're working with the people that we know deliver to our audience. And one of the things I, I think about when I look at Discovery, I think you've got a lot of channels. Would you ever consider like shrinking the number of channels you have and concentrating on some of the tentpole brands, indeed the brands that you oversee? So uh, honestly, that is, that is a, a bigger, broader corporate question. You know, for me, I look at Discovery and science and what way I see science, which is kind of a, an offshoot of DNA of Discovery, it, it has a very specific niche that it's serving. I mean, the network is, it's the, the, the pure numbers are smaller than Discovery, but year on year they're growing, which is really hard in this environment. Like, they've found something there. So there's still opportunity for those. I think we all are always doing a lot of soul searching around where, you know, what's the tipping point? Where are we on that tipping point? And I don't know that I have the answer for that, but I, I imagine that the whole industry will have to right size itself as all of all the viewing habits continue to change. Uh, you've obviously bought scripts as well. That's a, that's a big part of the discovery story at the moment. Mm. How, is that, um, how is that working out for you on a sort of day-to-day -day basis? How is it changing your role? Um, it's been, it's actually been kind of exciting to feel this tremendous wave of change. It's also been a little bit unsettling, you know, at any company when something like that happens, you're like, what does this mean? How is this gonna work? Uh, but in bringing in all of these other cable networks into the family, um, it's been, it, I mean, the, the company as a whole feels very big and powerful, and especially in the US market. And that's interesting and exciting. Um, on a personal level, it's been nice to get to know my colleagues on these other networks. I didn't usually end up talking to them, but also just little things. So Shark Week was coming up. Hey, Food Network, do you guys want to do any programming around Shark Week? And they're like, sure. And they end up, have, end up having some synergy across all the networks where they're driving the week before Shark Week. They're doing shark-themed cake shows or you know, at a, a shark-themed party and stuff that's driving to Shark Week. And that's kind of a fun, huge opportunity that we never really had before. So you, will we see more of that sort of cross-pollination? Yeah, definitely. Is there, is, is there any like, obvious projects where you can collaborate in the future? I think... Or is it early days? It's early days. Uh, it, it's probably easier for something like TLC to cross-pollinate with them because it's a similar audience. So, you know, they could do a say yes to the dress and then maybe that same couple could do a House Hunters and you could have them pushing to each other and that makes more sense, you know, because the audience is the same. It's a little different for us, so we have to pick our moments. And Shark Week is such a, a broader pop culture moment, it made sense. Yeah. Um, but we'll have to see as it unfolds, to be honest with you. And I mean, there's been enormous consolidation you know, in, the, yeah. in the media sector, both in the US and the UK. Is it, it, 
why is that important that discovery has beefed up? Well, it definitely makes us feel bigger and stronger. And when you look across the landscape, you know, we just, we just feel like we're, we, we dominate cable, and that's really exciting. Okay, it's uh, about 10 minutes left of the session. Uh, there's now an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand and just say uh, who you are and where you work, um, the floor is yours. Is anyone going to be brave? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, we have one here. We've got a mic. It's coming from the other corner of the room. You can shout if you like. There's not many of us. <laughs> Hello, uh, David Henry, SBC. Um, I wondered if you're going to, or if you've got plans already, because it appears that Trump may well uh, be coming to the end of his presidency with the news. Is there any documentary being made of this at the moment? <laughs> I'm sure there are many being made <laughs> across the multiple 24-hour uh, news cycle organizations, not by us. Um, we, we honestly try to remain pretty apolitical, and you can get that on almost every channel all the time. So we want to tell stories that you know, it's not that we want to stay out of the news, look at the Thai cave rescue story, but we're not really political in that sense. Okay. Uh, the app doesn't seem to be working. So um, <laughs> in terms of, oh, is, there, is there any other questions? Uh, ah, there's, there's a couple here at the back and one here at the front. Um, Ian Russell, ITN. So um, in terms of engaging, for a UK producer to engage with Discovery, what's the best way of, for them to do it? And are there things that UK producers need to think about when they're making things for an American audience? So in, in our London office, there is somebody on the Discovery and Science development team based in the UK, Andrew O'Connell. And he, uh, probably a lot of you know him and connect with him, and he's a good conduit into us. We have a development team in New York as well, led by uh, Max McAuliffe on the series side. And on the documentary side, we have John Barden, and of course, Mark Eckhind, who runs Science Channel, is in New York. And then we have a whole team in LA as well. And, you know, I, I think, and I can recognize that oftentimes as a producer, it's like, who do I pitch to? Where is, my, where is my show going to have the best shot of, um, of getting through and getting to a green light? And um, I say a few things to that. I've been working really hard with this team, to this development team, to make sure we're all very well aligned, that we um, come across as one team. And no matter who you pitch, it will end up going into kind of this, the same um, meetings as we, as we talk through ideas. But I also say, you know, you, you might know Max in New York, and you might know Andrew here, but you know that um, Max is really into um, a, a certain genre you're looking at. He might be really into, I don't know, fishing in the Mississippi River, and you have the most amazing fishing in the Mississippi River show. Go to Max, right? You, you want to go where you think you're going to have passion, and you're going to feel like a connection um, with the development exec. And, um, and, and that would be, at least, at least you'd feel like you're, you're really having a connection there. And, it, and then it might, be, it might be Andrew for something else if he's passionate about it. And I think that's what you all deserve, frankly, as producers coming into pitch, is having somebody who might have the, have the best connection with the ideas you have. Um, and then as far as telling stories for an American audience, uh, I, I think that's, um, that's something we have to work together on through the, the post process. It is, there, is, there are some unique you know, shifts in, in how we tell things or how, how UK shows are versus how US shows are. But I would look to you connecting with whoever on the network side is working with you to make sure we're all on the same page and that you're getting very clear direction as to what we think will work best. So how did it work with Cajun Navy? Because that was obviously Lightbox, a UK company. Yeah, so they, they had actually, they brought that into um, Andrew O'Connell, mm -hmm. who loved it. 
Um, he brought it to John Barden in New York, who was leading up our documentary stuff. He loved it. Uh, and the two of them together have stayed on it and, ha and pushed it through the system together. So it really ended up becoming, it's kind of the best case scenario of it becoming a joint effort. That's some inspiration for producers in the room there. Mm -hmm. um, there was a couple of hands at the back. So yes, just here. Uh, hi, um, I have a question about some of the sort of M&As and all that's happening in uh, the US sort of entertainment industry with AT&T, Time Warner, and Disney and Fox. Um, how do you think that is going to influence, I guess, the consumer, but also just the ecosystem in general, these types of? That's a big question. I don't know if I have a big answer to that. Um, we like big questions. I know. Um, <laughs> I think we're all, frankly, curious what it will all mean to see these companies consolidating and getting bigger and bigger. I don't think we, any of us really know what it means yet. And um, you know, we can all control the world in which we're in. And oftentimes when I get, I'll be honest with you, when, when it's just like, what's gonna happen over here and what does it mean to me? I often, I swear, I'm like, you know what? I was hired to do this job, why don't I just focus on this job right now? And, um, and, and as the reverberations come through, we'll deal with them. But it, it's really hard to know. But it is, it's big, it's a big deal. Uh, so I'll take a question from the app. Uh, oh, what's the, <laughs> we've got some. Uh, so what's the biggest work culture difference between Discovery and TLC? Be as candid as you like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's interesting, because there are completely different work cultures uh, from going back and forth to both. And uh, oddly, I think they're somewhat reflective of the programming and the mood and mode of the, of the channel. So, you know, TLC has a little bit of fun with itself. Um, our biggest new launch this year is Dr. Pimple Popper. It's a huge hit. Um, you know, we pitched it that. It sounds grim. I don't even want to watch it. It's amazing. <laughs> you should watch it. It's amazing. Um, but that's very TLC, right? It's, it's, um, it, it actually has a lot of heart in it, but it's kind of, uh, it, it's, it's kind of crazy at the same time. And um, that's definitely TLC is a little bit, takes itself a little bit less seriously, as it should, as the programming does. Um, on Discovery, it's a, it's, it feels a little bit heavier, I'll be honest, as a culture. And, and I think they feel, the weight of that discovery globe on their shoulders, and by they I mean me, too. But um, it's, it is a very, a very different culture in that it, feels, it just feels heavier, and I've been working really hard to try and, it's very, it's very hard to be creative when you're feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders. And I've been working very hard to try and, and break that. It's never gonna be TLC, right? It, and it shouldn't be, they're very different, but we're, we're trying to create um, a more safe and fun environment because that's when you can be the most creative. Okay, we've got time for one more. So we've got a couple of hands here. I was just conscious of some people at the back. We've, uh, I'm going to go to the back just because I don't want people to miss out, basically. So. Hi, it's uh, Danny Fenton from ZigZag. <laughs> if there was um, a show on another channel or platform that you'd most like to have on Discovery, what would it be? Hmm. I think there's something really interesting about hunting Hitler on history. And um, I don't know if it's that exactly, but something that's investigative and can go on and on for seasons. And I think the producers who do that, Cargo 7, they do a very good job with it. Um, and that's something that I look at and think, hmm, how can we do something like that? That was one of my backup questions in case we didn't get any questions from the audience. So thank you, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Danny. Uh, I'm afraid that is all we have time for. Um, thank you to our sponsors for this session, the British Film Commission and Screen Scotland. Uh, but most of all, thank you to Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.